Greetings, Space Cadets. We are going to be playing Kerbal Space Program 2. My name is Daz Tactic. Welcome to the channel and welcome to this series. This is going to be actually part one. I have done a part zero, which is an introduction. Oh, there we go. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Got Kerbal Nauts coming through. The introduction screens just look fantastic uh, in the actual game itself. Anyway, I won't get too tied up. These are going to be fairly long videos because I'm going to be explaining things in a lot of detail. This series, as I would have explained in my in my introduction to the series, is really going to be geared for new players. I'm going to be trying to explain the concepts and principles behind why we're doing everything, uh, which will make more sense for you when you then go to start to plan your own specific missions. Uh, I think it's it's much more important that you actually get a, an understanding of what's going on more so than just to put this part here or that part there to get a result to do one thing. Uh, much better to learn to fish than to be given fish, if you know what I mean. So that's what the approach we're gonna be taking. Uh, we're just gonna go into single player. I'll just get started. I'm just gonna start a new campaign. I'm gonna just keep it on normal difficulty. By the way, this is the uh, pre-launch version of the game. And uh, with that in mind, um, there's going to be changes that will come fairly thick and fast. The game is actually very slow at different times. Also, when, I'm, when I'll be recording, there'll be a lot of stuttering and things going on. That should be optimized slowly over time. Uh, what we're going to do through here is we're going to go and change our agency flag. I, I can't find a way just yet to be able to put my own... Uh, my own little symbols into everything, but we can just go and change the colors. I might just go and do the base color here. I'll make it sort of like more of a a, 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 yellow, a goldy sort of uh, like color into, through here. We'll change this again when we get in there. I do really like this aspect of the game itself now. It's sort of got like the, the different sort of accent colors. I'll just go there, just so we end up with sort of like a, a gold, a bit of a gold. Actually, I'll make that even more yellow. There we go. We'll make it more the Daz Tactic uh, colors. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, if you are new to the channel, um, please consider liking and subscribing, or any sort of interaction is certainly very, very useful. And also a special thank you to anyone that does support the channel, whether you be a Patreon supporter, a um, buying merchandise, or anything like that. It's very, very much appreciated. God, I love these little animations with the, everything that's coming through. Uh, thick and fast. Anyway, we'll set these agency colors. This is our new agency colors. Uh, this is actually brand new in the game, which is really, really cool. So I'll go through these little changes as well because they, they are quite good. Now, I'm going to turn off the first-time user experience, but I would strongly suggest if it is your first time with the game, leave that on. Uh, it'll set certain things up for you and make it a little bit more helpful for you, but we're going to turn that one off. So when enabled, you'll receive additional information outside of tutorials that will explain features and concepts when first encountered. This option ca can, uh, cannot be disabled for a campaign once enabled. So at this point in time, I'm guessing at some point in the future they may change that, but at this point in time, uh, you have to do it. Uh, basically, you either have it on or off at the start. I'm going to turn it off because it will get in the way of what I'm trying to explain. So we'll start the campaign. In we go. All right, here we are. The uh, Kerbal Space Center uh, is what we're actually looking at, at part, which is part of the Kerbal Space Agency. Uh, we've got four different buildings we can go to. Strongly, strongly suggest that you do the training uh, rate, um, missions uh, before you really sort of get into the game. That will explain a lot of the basic concepts. There are a few things in there where it doesn't really do a good job of explaining what some of the things mean. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, fill those gaps for you. But overall, one of the best tutorials I've seen in any game ever, uh, it's just the way that they've done it, it's very, very good. Uh, it's just, it will get you started with certain things, but you will need to practice just to get a feel for it. Uh, the uh, tracking station just gives you a view of the, it's essentially it's your map, uh, your, your, uh, solar map or Kerb, uh, Kerbal uh, map where you get to see all the different planetary bodies and anything that's in orbit, etc, etc. Launch pad is what we're seeing down through here. This is where the vessels get launched from. And then back over through here is the Vehicle Assembly build Building or the VAB. This is where we actually then go and design the, the craft. They either get sent down to this launch area or across to the runways. So there's runways out through there as well. So, uh, and these are four planes. Now, in this series, as, as I would have explained in episode Episode zero. I'm going to be going through in both aspects, uh, showing you how to build a plane, maybe get up to building a space plane, which is a, a plane that can get into orbit and actually then go to other planetary bodies. They're quite good fun. Uh, maybe a little advanced for this sort of uh, beginner's tutorial that we're sort of really looking at through here. Uh, I'll definitely be doing future content, doing those sorts of things, if, and if I don't really cover it much 
in this particular series, but I probably will try to get there, I, I would think. Uh, now, the uh, VAB is where we, where we want to start because that's, we, we don't have anything we can launch just yet. So we'll go across into here. It does take a little bit of time just to load in the screens, but not too bad. There we go. So if you had started with the helper, uh, like with, with the actual help, you're going to end up with a favorites panel in through here that will be all flashed out with the components we're going to start using. Now, in this first video, I just want to get into orbit and get back home again. That's all I want to do. And by home, I mean to the surface of the planet, not back to the Kerbal Space Program, sorry, Kerbal Space Center. So just back to, back to the, the surface of Kerbal from orbit uh, is all we want to be doing. So um, we're going to be de designing a spaceship. Now, what do we build? How do we start? What do we do? All these sorts of things. Let's just go through one way of approaching this. Uh, we are going to have to go through certain principles, which you're going to have to use time and time again. But one, one interesting way of actually having a look at this is to start off by looking at the trip planner. So let's open this thing up and that way we can sort of explain what a lot of the other concepts are that we're going to have to then design. So if we go and click on this one through here, you can see it's going from Kerbin to BOP is the one that it's sort of doing a one way trip or you can do a round trip as well and sort of see all sorts of different numbers in here, which won't really make a lot of sense to you. Uh, let's just go and clear the results. So we're going from Kerbin to somewhere. In this case, we're going to go from Kerbin to and we're just going to scroll down and we'll just they make it to the the moon or the moon. I'll, I'll keep on defaulting to moon, but essentially it's the it's the Kerbal equivalent or the Kerbin equivalent of our moon. And so we're just going to do that one. And ultimately, as we go through this little series, we'll end up sending missions to the moon uh, or mum. <laughs> and I would suggest that you just use the one way trip uh, for these sorts of things and then adapt it. Uh, if we do the round trip, this isn't quite as accurate as what I would like. Uh, the round trip basically just doubles the amounts. You can see that through there. Uh, if I do the round trip, we essentially end up with double the, the, double the amount that we actually had previously in there. It's easier for me to explain what, what everything actually means just from this single trip, and then we'll just add a little bit more onto what we actually require. Now, one thing that the tutorial at this stage doesn't actually explain is, uh, is what this actually is in through here, this triangle with the letter V. It's called Delta V, okay? So it does say Delta V. What does that mean? It basically means change is the triangle, which is the delta. So delta is a, a Greek symbol meaning change and the V is velocity. So we need to have a spacecraft that can actually generate at least 5,120 changes of velocity. So delta V. And so this is what we need to do to actually be able to do what this requires. Now it splits it down what it needs to do. Of that 5,120, it uses 3,400 of that just to get into orbit. So in, to get from, from Kerbin into low orbit around Kerbin, is, we're looking at 3,400. So let's just say 4,000 delta V is what we'll sort of be targeting just to get into orbit initially. So with that in mind, I won't worry too much about these other things. These are the, then when we start to sort of do the orbital mechanics to then move away. You can see it's a lot less delta v or change in velocity to move once we get into orbit it's actually it's quite efficient at that point but we have to get into orbit and orbit is the hard thing because we have to go through the atmosphere and i'll explain that when we sort of start to then sort of actually get into orbit itself and so this one here is really the key number 3400 but let's just give ourselves a little bit extra particularly if you are new to the game because you are going to be inefficient with the way to actually do different things so let's just put in our heads 4000 delta v is our target that's what we need this for so that's just so we now have a, a figure for an aspect of the game which will make sense when we get to it <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's go across. To build a, this is the VAB, I can just use, I won't go through the actual keyboard commands to sort of uh, rotate around or you know, sort of look around at different things. You, it, and it is just a right mouse button, but you'll, if you've done the tutorial, which I suggest that you do, it will explain all of that to you. Uh, let's just go across, 
go into. Now, the first thing we need to do when we create a craft is actually to work backwards in terms of what's the last thing we need to do. The last thing we need to do is to get back to the surface of, of Kerbin. And to do that, we're going to need to have a, like a, a spacecraft with a, with a Kerbal Nought inside it and, uh, and with a parachute. So that's really our basic points of what we need to do. So let's go back to the command module. Every single craft that you design will start with a command uh, or a control vessel. Now, it may be a manned pod or an unmanned probe. Uh, you've got cockpits here for aircraft and you've even got sort of like rover uh, uh, piloting stations as well, like large or extra small, for example, to build rovers for other planetary bodies. We won't get to that in this tutorial series. Um, I won't even bother with probes, but probes are unmanned. Uh, they require electricity to be able to uh, to be able to operate and you need to then communicate with them. We won't worry too much about any of that. The easiest one for us to do is to send a Kerbal Nought to pilot the craft. And so we've got different sizes. This is new in Kerbal Space Program 2, which is great. It's very simple, but God, it makes a big difference. And so this is the, uh, this is the size of the main connector. And in this case, we've got like a, uh, this is a, an Explorer, a single seat lander can. This is more if we're going to be actually landing on other planetary bodies and we will do that so we will actually do that in this particular series but not right now we're just going to grab a one man so this is a or a, a single seat command pod this is the mark one tin can and uh and so we're just going to go and grab that one and that's going to be the start now you can see there the colors these are the colors that whoops that we chose uh for the actual for our for our space center yours may be different so if it looks a bit different don't worry about that I might, I can also then just go and change these. I might just go and do that now globally. I might change the yellow to be more of a see-through rather than it being sort of like an opaque yellow. So let's just go across into our color manager. And so we've got the base color in through this side. With that selected, I'm just gonna change the alpha and that's gonna then sort of reduce the, that will make it more see-through. And we might sort of make it a bit more orange, I'm guessing. So let's just make it a little bit more orange back up through this side. A little bit of darkness in through that side and then we'll just set as agency colors and uh, and that will then sort of do it so this is now going to be a little bit more see-through and we click on that one back through there and um, and we apply that to the assembly now that should have changed that I'll just go and, and uh, remove that one entirely just press escape whoops wrong one yeah I just had to click on it with the uh, with the actual thing so this is now being set now, I can actually do it by part, and I can change the color of the parts. We, and we may do that just for the for the look, overall aesthetic of it. But you can see through there, this is now much more shiny in this part of it because we're now sort of seeing more of the metal. If I just change the alpha, and then just go and click on that again, um, might just make it a little bit less. I can then sort of see exactly what I what how I want this to look. So let's go and set those as the agency colors now. Uh, so we've got now an alpha aspect to them. And that's all we need to then go and do. Um, right, that's done. So uh, we will now just go and start to add more of them. Now, I can't get rid of this, unfortunately. The color manager, actually, if I click on that again, yeah, it won't actually do it. Let's just go across and uh, pick another, like an engineer's report. No, it's going to stay there, unfortunately. I'll see if I can get rid of it. Oh, of course, I've just got to go and click the selection tool. So it's, it's one of these that will always be activated. Selection tool just allows us to select from the side. The color tool allows us then to sort of just change the actual colors and make it look the way that we want it to look. So anyway, that's going to be the start of what we have. And so this is thinking back in, in, in reverse order. We need to have this one is going to be manned. There's going to be a, a, a Kerbal Nought inside this. We have a small connector or extra small connector at the top and a small connector at the bottom here. And so to look at some of the others, for example, if we go to, for example, a large uh, four, four seat lander can, this in terms of its scale is much, much larger than what we saw there before. And so this is actually something that we wouldn't want to do, of course, but you can get an idea of the scale of between a large and a small component so let's just go in when I hover back over you'll see that this little this is this the trash can is then highlighted so we've got uh, we've got the first bit through there let's just now go down to parachutes and so the top of this is extra small if I go to a small uh, parachute through here the mark 16 and go to click it you see how much bigger it is it's the same width as the bottom of the actual of the actual command pod and so I don't want that what I want to do is I want to just get an extra small. So we'll start this way 
and we'll just throw an extra small on top. And so we've now got the small, the extra small parachute. So now we actually have a system where we can get back. So at least if we get up into space, we now have a parachute. And when we have a look over through here, an O1 has been added, and this is actually our staging. And so this will, this will end up just being shuffled further and further up through the staging. If you've done the tutorial, that will make a little bit more sort of sense as we start to build things up. Now, when we come back in, at this point in time of recording, heat is not really an issue, but it will be. And so we need to also protect from any heat that may sort of uh, impact the craft. And so we're going to go across to thermal. And these are just the heat shields. Again, we've got a small component at the bottom there. I'm just going to grab the small and just click it in there. And now we have a heat shield attached to the bottom of the craft. And so now we've, we can protect against smashing into uh, Kerbin itself with the parachute and we also then have the uh, the heat shield at the bottom through there as well By the way, you'll sort of see that there are often there'll be little things that will then highlight and I won't go through those right now But these these you can customize all sorts of different things in the game And so I'll uh, talk about that when it's when it's appropriate. Okay, so at, at, at this at this stage We're just learning to crawl. <laughs> we're just gonna get into orbit and get back down again so with that in mind, uh, we need to then, whatever's connected to the bottom of this, we need to make sure that this one can be disconnected when we're trying to get back into the, into the atmosphere. So we need to decouple or separate from anything below this one. Again, we're just working in reverse. We're just going to go across. We've got decouplers back. So this is coupling, separate stages and stock. And so we've got stack decouplers back in through this side. Uh, and always just, you can read a little bit of the uh, of the comments there or the or the description. So this is a, a, a one-sided a, a detachment module made for small rocket stacks or payloads. The arrows painted on the, um, the sides indicate which side will decouple. And so we don't need to bring back anything. This is a stack separator, for example, uh, designed to jettison whatever is attached to both sides of it. And so it will then sort of push everything else away. We only really need to have this small one and just the decoupler itself will attach to whatever was below it. Not not really a problem and so we're just going to go and do that one you can see the little arrow and so that's going to push off the top area from whatever's below it so we're just going to go and place that one in there we've now got a decoupler it's got a little sort of ridge around the outside through there and so that's now going to be anything that's below that one will now be decoupled at this stage so that decoupler is now showing in the stage aspect of whatever it's doing. I'm just going to middle uh, middle click so we can sort of start to sc scroll around. Now we're going to need to have a little bit of maneuverability in the, once we actually get into orbit. We don't need much actually once we actually get there, but we may need a little bit of a, a boost to get into orbit initially and then to come back out of orbit. So we need to have a little bit left in the tank from orbit to get back in again. So let's go now and get a fuel tank. So we'll just go into the fuel tanks in through here. I'll just quickly explain what we sort of see through here. We've got methylox, we've got methane, we've got monopropellant, we've got xenon, we've got hydrogen, and we have a fuel line through there as well. So the, the different types uh, all do different sorts of things. They have different engines and they have different purposes. So um, xenon and hydrogen are sort of like more the high level uh, fuel that is used for interplanetary type uh, type like, like very very long uh, journey. So we're not going to really worry about those at all. We know so they're not really anything that we need to sort of uh, concern ourselves with. Uh, I'll talk about them in other in other episodes. Probably probably not even in this series. Actually, we just have no need for them. Monopropellant is a very very small aspect of the um, like this essentially allows us to use what's called RCS thrusters or sort of like reaction thrusters which allows us to do little maneuvers now if we if we need to be doing orbital maneuvers to try to get uh, for example the um, uh, like docking or anything like that we'll need to put this fuel on there but for this craft we don't have any of that requirement we don't need to have maneuverability in space other than just normal engines so the monopropellant is not important in, in terms of as, as a fuel source having said that if i right click on my on my area through here my tin uh, my tin can what this, by, by right clicking it brings up the part uh, manager and we can see through here we actually already have a little bit so 0.04 tons of monopropellant anyway. Now we actually don't need it. I can if I wanted to think, okay, I'm gonna save a bit of space, a bit of a little bit of uh, weight, and we're just gonna get rid of the monopropellant. But look, I'll leave it in there for now, but you can actually go and tweak these things 
in the parts manager if you did want to. A few other things that this thing actually does have, which we'll talk about when we actually sort of be using it, it's got a, um, a, a control orientation. We can either have default is going to be sort of controlling it from the front, but we can also change that around to have it reversed. So for example, if we had for some whatever reason had built this whole thing upside down and you can do that, you can actually then reverse the control orientation so that it still controls in the way that you, you're used to doing it. But in this case, we'll just leave it on default. We have no reason unless this thing was flipped upside down, but you may have like a, for example, a lander that is built upside down and you're controlling the ship from that particular lander. It may be what you do, you just don't know. And so you can actually go and change it through there. Now you also have a reaction wheel. Now the reaction wheel is a way of maneuvering the, 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 the facing of the ship without having to use fuel to do that. It's done through like gyro, gyro wheels. And so this has got like a small gyro wheel or reaction wheel uh, in the actual craft itself. You can turn it off if you just don't need it. But in this case, they're always useful. So uh, we will actually just keep that one on. But this is why we're going to be able to maneuver without actually having to use like the RCS thrusters, for example, which we just spoke about before with the monopropellant. So if we didn't have this reaction wheel, we may end up in a position where we just the only way that we'd be able to maneuver a, a, like a larger craft would be through uh, the monopropellant. And so we'd need to then have the other thrusters put on, which we won't do at this stage, but we will eventually need to do that. Uh, with the game. Anyway, that's the reaction wheel. Uh, it's also then, th this is got like torque enabled through the reaction wheel, yes. And torque mode is gonna be for anything. Any sort of reaction that we do with the craft will then be using this this gyro, gyro wheel to then start to do, the, to do what we're doing. The thing is with this though, it uses electricity. So we have to, if we, Overuse it. We're going to our electricity um, in this in the ship will then be dissipated. Now we don't need to worry about it because we're only just going into orbit and coming straight back down again. And so we also have like an electrical charge. We got uh, 50 uh, U. I'm not sure what the U, U actually is through here. This is the amount of electrical charge that this thing will carry with it. Now the engines will also generate electrical charge. So we don't need to add add much to it because we're going to be using the engines pretty much the whole time for this first ship, but we will eventually need to have batteries and so on and so forth attached to the actual craft, particularly when we go to the moon and do things like that. So we'll get to that eventually. But this has got like a this has got like the basic building blocks of a lot of things that we, you know, so we do actually have the capacity to store energy, uh, to to react and to maneuver the ship, uh, to store some monopropellant as well, if we just need to have a little bit of, um, of maneuverability, if we put thrusters on the ship. And so the actual tin can itself comes with some extras, which is great. Anyway, let's just go and uh, remove the parts manager. I thought I'd just explain these as we go through. So we now have a, a section underneath the ship and what I might do is I might just see how I go. So, and again, I haven't pre-built any of these. We'll just use what we had initially with our, uh, with our trip planner. Again, the 4,000 change in velocity, we're now gonna to start, to, this will start to now make sense. We now need to start to think, okay, well, how much of that are we gonna to need to maneuver into orbit and get back out of orbit? And it's only gonna be a small amount. And so let's just go back in. We'll just go and get rid of that for a second. So, sorry, the other the other types of fuel that we actually have, we've only got two more types. Methane is uh, is like the just pure rocket fuel or pure jet fuel, essentially. And so you can see through there, it probably does sort of say that one. So um, there's a small methane fuel tank, the staff at C7 Aerospace, ve vehemently did it was originally designed using a, a, a methalox a fuel tank. So this is actually, these are mainly used for aircraft because the oxidizer, the oxygen that's required to add with the fuel to actually then create the actual burning is uh, created from the atmosphere. So these, as long as there's oxygen coming in from outside, they can mix it together and then burn it. But when we go into space, we need to have methane and oxygen in the, in the one tank. And so this is what all of these main tanks actually are. These are our methalox tanks, and we can sort of use them at all sorts of different sizes. Um, you know, there's all sorts of different ways of, of doing this, but we're just gonna keep it very, very simple and just have a look at the smallish, or the small the small connectors that we actually have in through here. These four in here are the ones that are the most of most interest to us. Now, I could really get away in this case with either using a very, very small um, 
a tank in through this side or probably the next one across. So I'll just go to this small tank in through here. Let's just go and add this one to the mix. And so we now actually have a little bit of, and if I right click on this one, we can see there, we've got uh, 0.2 tons of methane and 0.8 tons of oxidizer. And so these combine to create the fuel, the rocket fuel that we require to give us our thrust. And uh, you can see there, it doesn't actually add anything to the actual staging at this point in time. Now we need to burn it. Now there's four different types of engines in the game. So let's just go back across now to engines. Now that we've got some fuel, we go to the engines. And this, you can see that there's a, well, there's a few different major types. We've got methalox engines, which is what we need to use for the methalox uh, rocket fuel. We have solid solid fuel boosters, which are uh, they're not very efficient engines, but they're uh, but they are very useful to get through the uh, the soup that is the atmosphere around Kerbin. And so, quite often, you need to just boost these things up. Uh, using these to at least just break out into into orbit. So we may have to add one of these. We'll find out fairly soon. Uh, then you've got like jet engines back and through here. And then you've got the, like the uh, the different monopropellant engines. This is actually a, a full-blown engine that uses monopropellant. Then you've got like xenon engines, which are sort of like an electrical type engine. And then you've got your hydrogen engine. So that's all, all the different types of, of engines that are using the different types of fuel. So for us, we need to keep looking at the small sizes. And what you'll see through here is that we'll see that you've got like a, um, uh, this is like an orbital um, methalox engine. Now orbital engines have got, and when we hover over this one, you'll sort of see that it's got like a number of different statistics. It's got a mass, this is, a, this, is a, this is like half a ton. Uh, the maximum temperature it can actually withstand is 1,000 Kelvin, which is, which is fine. The impact tolerance, if it was coming back to Kerbin, if it's going, or anything actually, if it hits anything at greater than 10 meters per second, it's going to explode. Uh, the maximum thrust at one atmosphere is 30.4 kilo, uh, kilonewtons, and the maximum thrust in a vacuum is 60 kilonewtons. Now, orbital... Uh, engines will tend to be the ones that work most effectively in a vacuum. So 60 kilo, kilonewtons is what we have to then sort of consider for this one through here. And this is also mainly used for maneuvering. So these will then have like an, uh, an ISP at one atmosphere of 170 and an ISP in a vacuum of 335. Now, ISP is your efficiency of the engine. So we have to then consider are we going to be using this one in space or are we going to be using it like on the surface? And really, we're going to be only really using this engine in space. And so a vacuum, in, in both cases, the maximum thrust, the 60 kilonewtons in the vacuum is important. And the ISP the, in the vacuum, has it's got like a, a very, very high efficiency in use in vacuum. Now, if we have a look at a few of the other engines, just to sort of uh, round this one out, the next one we come across is a launcher type uh, engine. And you'll see there that this one's got like a, um, the ISP it, it, at one atmosphere of 260 is, is a much, much more efficient than the smaller orbital. Like the orbital was 170. This one's got an efficiency of 260. And you'll notice there that the actual maximum thrust is also very, very high at 221 as, as it, like in, in the terms of the uh, one atmosphere in, 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 as opposed to just the 30 kilo, kilonewtons uh, at one atmosphere for the, uh, for the Terrier engine. Uh, and so this is a launcher engine. These are mainly just to get you off the ground and get you close to orbit. So we don't want this one because we're, we're going to be doing our maneuvering. Remember, we're building from the top down. So we don't need this one yet. Uh, the next one across here is a sustainer engine, which is a bit of a hybrid. It's, uh, it usually has a good um, efficiency in both vacuum and also in atmosphere. You can see there the ISP at one atmosphere is 280. The ISP in the vacuum is 320. Uh, it, and it also has a reasonable uh, maximum thrust um, in, in both in the atmosphere and also in the vacuum. So they're the basic types. There's a whole lot of other ones in through here. This is a vector engine, which is a, um, a massive, essentially this is, it's called a sustainer, but this one's got incredible um, thrust. Like, so the maximum thrust at, at one atmosphere is 769. In a vacuum, it's 850. So this is, a, this is actually a very, very powerful engine, much more powerful than we, what we actually require to do what we have to do here. So we're just gonna use the Terrier in this case, because this is really just a small orbital engine. We don't need much power with this particular engine. So let's just go and throw that one on. 
So that's now got this one done. We're now going to start to see some interesting information um, now that we've got the engine. Now you can see there that after that one, this is actually the burning of this particular stage. And so when this when this engine now burns, this is now our bottom stage. The, the first stage is now going to fire this one off. If we go and actually open this little area up, it's then going to open up uh, the fuel and also Delta V. So we have a Delta V of 1,300 from this engine and the fuel tank above it. If I went and just move that engine off to the side, move that one off to the side and just go back to my fuel tanks and go back to a smaller engine, sorry, smaller fuel tank and throw that one on board, we'll now see that we've only got 735 delta V or change in velocity. And so we can start to then, with that 4,000 that we had in mind, how much do we need to go into orbit and come back again? Now, every time we do this, we're changing the overall weight of the, and you can see there that, that launch, this is um, uh, 735 meters per second is the actual delta V that we have in there. Now, this is not its ability to do much other than to change velocity or potential velocity. Uh, to get off the surface, we have a, f a whole lot of other things that we have to then get past as well. And let's just remove the parts manager for a second there. If we now go and click on, for example, the, um, the next one across here, the engineer's report, and have a bit of a look at this, we can see that we have a thrust to weight ratio of 1.2. And so anything over one means that this could actually lift off, which is actually good. Let's just go and move that one off to the side, move this one back across, we'll just ditch it for now move this one back in where we get more weight, add this one back in there, our engine, our, now our thrust to weight is 1.015. We're barely gonna make it off the surface. If I got an even heavier uh, uh, fuel tank, I'll just go and grab the next one up, throw that one on, put this engine back in. You can see our Delta V is gonna keep on improving all the time, but now we have a problem. Our thrust to weight ratio is under one. And so we now have an error coming up. So thrust to weight ratio is less than one. Our vessel will not leave the launch pad. So it can't launch from Kerbin. But if we were in space with this, we'd have so much delta V to be able to then maneuver. But it's really not a, it's not a good idea for us to use this uh, with this particular engine. Uh, we don't have the need for it. We don't have the need to push all of this weight up into space because if we just leave... I hope I'm making sense with this, but if we actually, sorry, if I just go back and uh, ditch that one, put this one back on board, I'm left with a, with delta Vs of, of 1,300. Might just get rid of the engineer's report. I was just showing you this because we do have to consider for the last stage what, our del what the uh, thrust to weight ratio actually is. We need it to be reasonably high, like probably closer to two than, than to one. This would barely move and it would burn through all of the fuel essentially uh, before we ended up doing anything. Now the overall total mass of the of the whole assembly is three tons but the dry mass without the fuel was 1.72 so as it burnt the fuel it would become it would the thrust to weight ratio would improve and then it would slowly sort of start to move up but we wouldn't get very far because of this low ratio. I hope that makes sense. Um, as we start to build more, we'll come back and have a bit more of a look at this one. But the important thing here is that we now have a, a way of getting 1 1.3, uh, 1,300 delta V of the 4,000 that we required. So we're, we're part way there. Now, we also then need to eject anything that's below this. So we'll, uh, we can sort of uh, zoom on down a little bit. We'll put another decoupler. So this is gonna be our last stage before we then come back into, uh, into the atmosphere. So we'll just go back to our decouplers again, get us another small decoupler, throw that in the bottom there. It's then gonna add it into this side. I might just um, push that one back a little bit. We can sort of see the overall Delta V. Now we need to try to aim for the 4,000 total Delta V to get up and back. So uh, we now have another stage in through this side. Now we can sort of look at, at maybe just trying to just do this all with one stage to go all the way into orbit. So let's just go across into our fuel tanks. Uh, we'll go and get a large fuel tank in through this side. So we've now got like a um, a lot of fuel. Uh, the weight itself of the, of the ship will now be much, much higher, but we can go back to our engines now and we can try some of these other engines. Now this one here 
is a sustainer engine, which means it will then gimbal. And gimbal means it can then change direction. And we may need to do that. So let's just try this one on and see how this one goes. Again, the, the maximum thrust, if I tried to put a Terrier engine on and threw that one on there, um, it would, we're actually close to the 4,000 uh, delta, uh, delta V that we need. But if I go do the engineer's report, there's no way. This one's now 0 0.38, uh, 0 0.383 thrust to weight ratio. So this is no good at all. So that one just cannot lift this off the, off the, uh, off the launch pad at all. Uh, we'll just get rid of that one. We'll go and try this one here. Now we've got these three. This one here has got an incredible thrust per uh, th uh, thrust to weight ratios now we don't need to have overkill it will just it'll rip through the fuel We've, let's just add it on so you can see the difference this one has got like a thrust to weight ratio of 6.7 so no problem with that one but the delta v is only uh, only 2.6 so it doesn't quite sort of work but this is extremely strong uh, at 6.7 it's overkill really for this sort of ship but it's good to know that that, that that's what that would then do now these are both got very similar thrust to weight ratios. Um, this one here is actually got, I'm just looking at what's most efficient. And this one here is the more efficient engine, which means it will actually burn fuel slower, which will then improve our Delta V. I'll show you what I mean. If I throw this one on, uh, the Delta V is now 3,100 for this particular one. The thrust to weight ratio is comfortable at 2.5. So that's actually fairly good. Let's just go and, and put that one back and put this one back in. And now we've got a uh, 3.146. It's only marginal, but it's slightly better. And uh, and we still have a, like a two, a, a two to one uh, or a, a factor of two ratio for the thrust to weight ratio. So two is actually pretty much ideal. Um, but we only have 3,100, whereas we're aiming for 4,000. So how do we then improve the rest of it? Now, what I can do is I can keep on adding more fuel, for example, Let's just go and uh, do it this way. So I can sort of go and add another fuel tank in through there, throw that engine at the bottom there, and just sort of see what actually happens. And so we're still at 1.7, so that's actually going to get us off the ground. And uh, we now have 3,600, so we're getting closer to what we sort of require. If I get rid of that fuel tank and get one of these fuel tanks again as well, the bigger ones, throw that on the bottom. And now we have still 1.4, so we can still get off the ground with this one. Um, we now have more than what we require. So technically, this ship will actually or should get into orbit. Let's just try it and see how it goes. Um, we do have a very slow thrust to weight ratio back and through here. It may be almost better to go back for the, uh, for the overkill engine. Let's just see what actually happens if we put that engine back on board. So we now have a, a thrust to weight ratio of 4.8. But our delta V, because of the inefficiencies of this engine, is down now to 3.4. So it's not going to be enough with what we had calculated to be able to get up and back easily. That's the total for the whole ship, by the way. Uh, if I open this one up and just get rid of the engineer's report, you can see there that we've got 1,300 with that top stage. This one's only 2,100. And we needed to get to 3,400-ish to be able to then get into orbit uh, correctly. Let's go and ditch that one again, put this one back on board again. And so this one then does take us to 2.8. So it's not quite where we would want to go, but it's close-ish. We'd have this engine here is going to have to do a lot of work to finish everything else off. Um, this is where we can start to sort of tweak these numbers. Again, if we go back to the trip planner and have a look, just to get into low orbit is 3,400. Now, ideally, we get most of that done before we actually need to sort of use this engine. And this one still does it. It still actually does it. So technically, this actually should work. So let's try this and see if we can actually do it. Again, we're just looking to get to 3,400 plus a little bit extra to then get back again. So we want to get into orbit. All right, let's do this one. We'll just uh, push all that one back through there, get rid of the trip planner. And we will actually save this one. So this is going to be our um, DAS... Uh, Orbital 01, just as, a, as an attempt. And by the way, you are going to fail a lot with this. <laughs> just get used to it. I haven't put any any sort of, like I could put solid solid fuel boosters on this as well, which would probably make the, the, it more efficient and easier to then work with. But um, let's just go with that one. We do have a gimbling engine, so we can actually use the engine to uh, change the direction. I could actually add other things as well. Should I show it? Yeah. Oh. 
maybe I will. I'll just go and put aerodynamics on as well. And so we've got like different sorts of things. We've got stabilizing fins. Uh, I'll just put some really small stabilizing fins on the actual ship itself. And I won't, I won't do any detail with this. Now, if I, if I right click on this one, I can then just say, okay, I want four of these. I'm just going to go and place that. It makes the four there. By the way, you can use the, um, the X or the Shift X to sort of just cycle through these. So let's just go and add those. That's just going to give us a bit of stability as we sort of hit the, um, as we, as we leave. So it's a fairly tall rocket. But we know that the Delta V is just enough for us to do what we need to do with this first stage of the actual rocket itself. So let's just go and launch it. Now, we've got different launch pads we can launch from. I wish I hope they bring Woomerang back. But anyway, we've got the um, launch pad 1, 2, 3, and 4. We have the runways and we have the boat launch as well. So there's a few different launch facilities. Uh, we're just going to go straight to launch pad number 1, which is fine. So we'll just go across and uh, that's already been selected. And we'll just go and click on launch. So this is the the uh, DAS orbital. Um, we won't go new. I'll just I will save this. Um, yep, DAS orbital. There we go. So we'll save and launch. In we go. Okay. So to explain a few of the things now, at the moment it's not moving around because it's a fairly small rocket in the in the grand scheme of things. Let's just have it so that we're sort of looking at the uh, the front through there. There's the uh, the Kerbal Nort. In the in the command area again, I can sort of just use um, different uh, different ways of sort of maneuvering around the actual ship itself. Um, uh, that would be okay, and I can always just press home if I wanted to to bring it back to the default. So I can sort of always just bring it back to the, the, the default. But let's actually look at it from this angle. And so the things we're going to now look at carefully as we go up in, in, in the uh, into orbit is we're going to be using this nav ball. Now I've gone a long way forward. I might even call this episode to a close because we've done the construction. And now we'll just go and actually do the next episode uh, where we actually then uh, get into orbit. So I think I'll actually split this on and went up through here, guys. So thanks for watching. Uh, and when we come back, we will actually send Bill Kerman into space and into orbit, hopefully. We may fail, but we'll, we'll, we'll fix it up at that point. So if you are watching this about how to design this particular rocket, uh, just be aware it may fail and we may need to go back to the drawing board. So please look at the next episode as well just to sort of see if it did actually work. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you then.